and I was reminded that we get this soil, the, the sand comes over and it goes on our, um, our cars sometime in, in um, you know, from the Sahara. It comes mm. over from the Sahara and goes on our cars. I don't know really what I'm talking about, but it, it was just, I tried to understand, you know, what it was all about. Why why would she be doing this, you know? And um, but it's something to do with uh, slavery. <laughs> oh, wow. Love it. It's something to do with slavery. So, and you get a free poster. So it's worth going to a chapter to hmm. get a free poster. Well, we um, like free things, Anne. Yeah. We like I free know, things. This is the picture that's on chapter where it says, we will hold hands together in Welsh. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, there's just, a lot of things going on there then. Yeah. yeah probably, you've unpacked a lot without so telling well. us much. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It's all right, Anne. Um, any news this week from you? Not on the, um, I, I I do, you know, check my, I'm on the um, Bridge End Archaeology site and I get your texts and posts and things and I try and share them because there's two sites. There's Archaeology Cymru Group and Archaeology Cymru where there's only a few people on there. Yeah. That was the, that was the original, you know, um, group. Um, but there we are. Yeah, same... that's fine, man. Okay. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Um, well, I haven't really got much in the news, but there was something that I sent Carl. Um, there's been an interpretation about certain cave paintings um, that they believe that it might depict some sort of sign language. And yeah. I do like the fact that they're coming up with this. Um, I even read one article where they're saying that um, there was a cave painting. I can't remember where. Um, but they said that the way it was drawn and the amount of detail and observation it looked very realistic. They believed that that was someone with autism that was uh, creating this image. And I like this new interpretation is coming out at the moment in terms of um, mental health and other conditions that are being represented throughout history, because it would have been something that would have gone on back then, but we obviously don't hear about it that much. And I do like the fact that they're looking at pre hip prehistoric people to actually um the American woman's popped up again um just how they're showing us um really that all different types of people I think is making history more personal again it, it reiterates my point that we need to keep history very inclusive of all walks of life and why I don't like archaeological departments and history departments withering away because it closes that to a lot of people who might have a different walk of life to us. Mm. So, um, yeah, it, it, it was, it's very interesting, especially this is something that has come about um, quite recently, um, that they believe that some of the hands shown in um, these paintings, mm. which is representing some sort of sign language and maybe knowing about that, mm. um, telling us more about what they mean and what they're trying to uh, bring forward to us. So, um yeah, it's been very interesting read. Um, the article is called Cave Paintings May Depict Ice Age Sign Language and is by InsideScience.org. So if anyone's interested, that is quite good. Um, I just got one announcement as well. Um, would anyone like a, a day school at the studio, um, which would include fish and chips on a Monday between 10 a.m. to 12 p.m.? Deadly silence. <laughs> um. Well, you know, maybe one day, yeah, we'll be able to sort of get together and uh, it, it's it's not um, it's not a very big room, though, is it? Oh, I, I, th I think it's possible. So I, I, they'll be looking at um, looking at early medieval bodies, but it, it is bigger now, the studio, and we can get more people um, involved in a safe manner as well, because obviously that's something that we have to think about. Um, so it's, it's up to you guys, really. Is that true, um, Richard? <laughs> pardon, I? I was going to say, is that true, Richard? I thought it, it was bigger. It is, is it? I, I think Carl's cleared quite a lot of stuff out of there. Oh, right. 
we start we started making a bit of room yeah that's you know it's nearly two years well, ago you know we always like uh, fish and chips and a, <laughs> a talk yeah. is, is carl gonna pay for this jess yeah chips um, I, I, I'm not sure. Well, no. then oh, I've yeah, been told sure. this by Carl. Yeah. So oh, yes, uh, it comes in. It comes in with the um, <laughs> you know, the money you pay. Of course. And <laughs> um, Carl said twenty pounds a head. Oh. <laughs> like me. <laughs> yeah. So uh, if you are interested, speak to Carl and you'll sort it out. It does seem nice. So we're getting more social now. Um, all the doom and gloom, I think, is starting yeah. to wither away as well. Yeah. No, really. No, it's scary. You know, getting to. You know, I would. I wouldn't want more people to come to our bridge end class because I don't think it's big enough. Mm. Well, is it the, the venue that we're in is temporary? So hopefully we get yeah. more people. But by the time well, we've I've got asked got them to put their names down, you know, give them to car. Well, actually, it should be you, but. You know, just to put their names down, really. So when we get a bigger venue, you know. Yeah, yeah. I I wouldn't stress too much about it, Anne. Um, mm. uh, from what I've got, one friend. Um, I've got one friend. He's working for the health minister of Wales, so I like to pick his brains about things. And I was worrying about this third wave. Um, and from what I can gather, the ones that should be really worrying at the moment from what they're saying is people with one dose, i.e. me, or people who haven't been vaccinated yet. So um, yeah. the, the, I, I, think it, the, the, I think the anxiety is still going to be with people for a while, um, but it's, it's slowly moving away towards our anxiety. Well, I think, you know, I, I think um, everyone's got to look at their own uh you know it might be just me because I've been in the shielding group you know mm. it might be that I don't feel comfortable you know yeah. but uh you know we'll have a talk about it yeah no that's fine Anne. um well I'll get into the lesson now anyway yeah, um I'm and in terms of the, the, this meeting on Monday um anyone's interested just speak to Carl um hopefully you'll yeah. have a little you'll pop up towards the end and can have a little chat and uh we can have that ray of sunshine from Carl that cheers us all up every lesson. Um, so I'll share the screen now. Um, today is, is, is a bit of a jumble of a, a mixture of things. It's not um, one set thing. It is, it is quite a, it is three, well, four things, but mostly three that I want to talk about. Um, one of them is something that I keep talking about, which is set in who, but... Um, I'm just looking at early medieval hoods and I, the reason why I said early medieval is because um, although all of them are considered to be Anglo-Saxon, I'm going to argue that one of them possibly isn't. Um, but the book that I'm holding here, um, this book is called Archaeology, The Whole Story by um, Paul Barn. Um, this has been something that has been an inspiration for a few parts of my discussions and it looks around the world. It's quite a good book if you can get hold of it and it was quite disappointing because I go to the Waterstones quite a lot and um, I had a look at the history bit, there's loads of it, and then I go to the archaeological bit and there was only two books, so I snapped this one up. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very good book. Um, it gives you lots of pages and areas of uh, discussion. And the early medieval part, you get to it and it shows you different places on the map. So um, I was having a flick through this and I, I come across a horde and I thought what a better way to talk about than um, hoards and just treasure really um, from this period. And I think it'll fit in with me and Carl's argument that maybe we are looking at the early medieval period a bit too negatively um, in terms of how advanced they were and what they could create. So um, I think the hoards of the Anglo-Saxon period um, it, it, they're very important because we're getting a lot of interpretation from there. There's a lot of highly skilled artefacts in terms of craftsmanship. Um, and the, a lot of the archaeology that we're getting from these hoards tell us a, a bit more every day about um, the iconography, the um, jewellery, the gold, different types of trade and influences. And I think this is... Um, it's something that is of interest I think although these hoards can be very random and they can bring a lot of theories to them 
and why they're placed there I think they're just nonetheless important and especially some of the things that you find are just absolutely beautiful and um, because some of them are in random places um, a lot of people have found it through metal detecting so um, we can't really as much as metal detectorists and um, there's a page that I'm on um, I can't remember what it, what it was called um, but it was an archaeology page and they're very um, vocal and they've been vocal over the pandemic because there's been a rise in people using metal detectors. Now I know me and Bill have got one um, and it's my little baby. So I'm sure it's Bill's little baby as well. Um, and I know a lot of metal detectorists have done some good as well. And um, in terms of these hordes, um, I think that the reason why he's getting a bad rep is um, people like the ones that we were seeing from the beginning of the pandemic where they had a 10 grand fine um, because they were metal detecting on sites that they shouldn't have. And I think it sort of brings awareness. Well, there needs to be more awareness on what people can and can't do. I think some people think that because they have um, a metal detector, they can just go to a scheduled monument and just hack into it. And that's not the case. Um, I am a bit um, nervous about using mine. Is, um, so I do keep it quite local and I try and be careful of where I uh, use it. But I always dream about being one of those people that accidentally stumble across something as well. Um, and uh, so far, I have found a fishing weight um, <laughs> and a, a coin from 1942. So uh, nothing this uh, groundbreaking, um, but, but it's been very interesting anyway. Um, but these hordes are normally found through um, metal detectoring and they, they, they're able to uh, tell us a lot about trade, the influence from other cultures on our identity, on our art, our religion. And I say our, um, it's possibly just because I'm talking about Britain, because um, I know that I've been criticised by some people for using the word our, especially when I'm talking about Welsh history. And it is the case of we're not truly from here. There's a lot of different other races and um, cultures that are all part of us. And that's what makes up us. And I think that's why I focus on trades a lot, because you can look at diversity. Um, and I do think these hordes have shown us a lot of uh, the wealth of individuals, but it also tells us how, how they've interacted with other civilizations and how that's played a part. Um, and I think th this craftsmanship that we're seeing in a lot of the hordes are very advanced. They're using very advanced techniques. And um, it's shown us that the medieval period was more than just the dark ages they were actually um very advanced and these hordes are telling us a lot um and this is a diverse period i think the early medieval period is very diverse we've got the vikings we've got the um anglo-saxons we've got we've got so much going on here this part of our um land in britain that shows us that we're very diverse and i think this is how our identity has been formed over a number of years um, well, loads of years, but in terms of beliefs and traditions and influences just from other cultures. And I want to show that as best as I can. So the first horde that I'm going to come to is the Staffordshire horde. Um, and this came from this lovely book here. And um, they give you nice focal points as well. So instead of just talking about it, they uh, go deep into some of the artefacts. And this has been described to be one of the uh, largest group of Anglo-Saxon objects which was found in 2009 um, and it was also found some more in 2012 by metal detectorists as well in, and also by excavation but nothing significant was found it was just all this and um, the, the, it was unknown why they were buried there was no burial nearby there was no settlement nearby it was just that found there and they believe that three of the objects that were found in this hoard um, actually belong together but the rest is unknown and is, it, it ranges from 4,000 objects to 4,600 objects so it, it depends but a lot of them are fragmented objects um, and the total weight is um, 5.1 kg so you've got um, 11 pounds of gold 1.4 kg so three pounds of silver and you've also got this uh, garnet jewelry that's being thrown into it as well and 
this the style is what's been used to help update it and um, they haven't got a specific year of date they believe that it's between 550 to 670 um but nonetheless it's very important because of the amount that we're actually finding here um and quite a few people have come up with theories as to wh why they were buried what what was in them that was buried um and some people have even said maybe this was something like a robbery and uh, the thieves tried burying it or someone tried burying it to keep its importance and we'll never know. Um, and I think that's just the beauty with hoards really. But um, the, the scientific analysis of the various gold objects that were found indicates that in many cases, the original artisans knew how to, uh, how to treat upper surfaces to make the gold more pure um, and appear more golden. So we're having this advanced technique here of uh, making the gold stand out more and seem more regal and important. And I believe this is something of, uh, of someone who was of high status and quite a few people have believed that this is possibly signs of warlords. Um, there was also a helmet that was found which was very rare um, and this, this is sort of puzzled archaeologists, really, because they're trying to find out more from it. Um, but the, the helmet in itself is um, fantastic, but it's something that's not going to be of my focus today. Um, although quite a few of these hordes have got some sort of helmet associated with them. And uh, many of the items of the hordes have been removed and they, they've been... Uh, a few of the items that we see, they had... Um, part of it removes whether that be the gems or whether it be broken before it was buried and this is a common theme that we're seeing with quite a few of these hordes is that something of them is being damaged or removed and that to me alludes some sort of influence from the vikings because um in beowulf there's um a description of breaking um an item before burying it um almost like a, a ceremonial um tradition to, to let the spirit go before burying them in the afterlife um, and I think to me that going back to our last lecture on Thursday that this is showing the intermarriage or maybe the influence of the Vikings and how it stuck with the Anglo-Saxons um, but the, the, I think that it's, it's, it's very important to look at because we're looking at lots of different detailed objects here that can tell us so many things. And a lot of them are very high quality and well preserved. And I think that, that, that's just amazing. Um, and this hood is, is, is of radical importance, as is described in Anglo-Saxon archaeology, because they all have... Um, no specific object for female uses it seems to be um all male which is leading people to have this idea of it being warlords um and the quality of the workmanship is is very high like i said it's very advanced and i think it sort of pulls us away from this idea that it's the dark ages that everything was of poor quality and um we were living back in mud huts again and not knowing what's going on um but that this has been um, quoted to be worth 3.25, uh, no, 285 million pounds um, and under the Treasure Act of 1996. And it was purchased by the Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery um, and the Pottery Museum and Art Gallery as well. And there's, there's a lot of con uh, context behind them. There's a lot going on here, but um, this was, uh, deposited in a remote area just south of south of a Roman um, Watlin Street, um, and this is this has um, got a lot of interest because we're starting to see how this is uh, Anglo-Saxon coming to play in terms of what areas they would have been um, knowledgeable about. And the the first thing of interest for me is this um, technique. This uh, technique is. Um, distinctive with the Anglo-Saxons is where you have um, a plate of gold and they use garnet and here is also coloured glass um, stuck on with beeswax um, 
to, to stick it on and to fix it in place. And I think that's very advanced, although it's very simple, it's very advanced for what they're doing. They're going further than just having metal pieces. It's um, bits of precious gems in it. And this is uh, this word uh, colossum um, is coming from the word um, colossum, uh, meaning cell. So it's almost like they're all individual cells that are being placed together. Um, and I just, again, this is just highlighting how can you call this um, a period of the dark ages when you're seeing something that's as advanced as that um, and this French influence as well involved in it. And many of the objects were damaged. Um, but we're able to see the backing foils um, where the garnets would have been dis uh, dislodged um, on quite a bit of it as well. And quite a few people have discussed this because it's, it's very um, advanced and very beautiful. It would have taken a lot of time to do. And they said that this is someone of great importance, which is leading people further for this idea of a, of a warlord. Um, that this is someone of high status that they're showing off something. Um, the, the reason why it was buried, I really do not know. And I, I just think it just adds to the mystery. I wish I could just go back in time and just witness being, it being thrown into the ground, but sadly that's not the case. Um, and the purpose of this gold foil um, and the, the, this technique was to reflect the light and give um, the object a, a flash almost. Um, we're seeing that with this hoard, they're trying to make every piece stand out the most and scream at you, hey, look at me, I've got more money than you. It's, it's almost like when people drive around with a, a shiny, fresh Lamborghini, um, it's all cleaned and it's been waxed up because they're showing off and they, they want everyone to have a look at them. Um, and I think that's what this individual was doing as well. And there's, there's a lot of uh, religious... Um, uh, context behind a lot of these as well so there's more than just um, a high status individual I think this is an individual that has got a religion to them that they use to legitimize um, what they were doing and we'll see this as we go further um, but the decorations um, the way that this was buried the way that they've been created it is believed that this was something of part of a looting and that's why it was buried because um, the, the individual tried to hide them and um, tried to cover up what they were doing. And um, the, the discovery of this, I, you can imagine how amazing it would have been, especially for the metal detectors to find all this possibly as well. But there's been a lot of uh, research into all this as well in 2012 to clean and investigate these objects and this is where they come out with um, how they would have, would have been stuck on. I think that's just amazing that they know that it was beeswax. Mm -hmm. And then we get to this. The reason why I've called it the unknown object is because the book that I've got in front of me and I couldn't find it for love nor money online to tell me what it is. So I, I put my own theory into it um, and it just seems a little bit more logical to me. But this is highly decorated. Um, we've got this, um, which is it's the only object. So... Um, the one I just showed you in this one, they they thought to be one of uh, the two out of the three that are all connected with, with each other. But this is the uh, painted glass here, this pin here, the coloured glass that's on top, which is the only part of the hood that have got this slab of glass just chucked into it. Um, and then you've got these little uh, squiggles on the side, which are adding just little unnecessary detail, really. Sorry, I just coloured that in. But unnecessary detail, but it is necessary because it just adds to the prestige and how wealthy it is. Um, over here in these little parts here, there would have been garnets put in. You can see where they've all fallen out by here. And we're still seeing evidence of parts of it here and some by here, but it, it would have all been gold um, using the last technique to actually um, make it shine even more. And what I thought this was, was possibly um, the, the top of a sword. So the sword would have come um, down um, here. Um, so that, that this being the uh, handle where your hand would have gone. Um, that's where I believe it is. Um, like I said, a lot of it has been fragmented and broken. Um, whether that be um, something of just removing something of someone and remembering them, 
Um, some people have argued that if this was a warlord, maybe they had died in battle and the people who remembered him, his close family, could have possibly buried all this um, in his memory, um, which is also an interesting one. But I do think that it's something that has been stolen, been buried um, over time. Jess? Yeah? Can I make a comment? Go on. I, I, do, I like him in his fine bill. Go on. I've got, I got my, my book on the hoard here. On the top piece, okay, in my book is shown separate from the shoulder piece. Right, okay. And, oh, and, and, and what it says is for the top piece, the wooden says golden garnet setting containing a glass gem. Both glass and, and, and enamel were materials used by the Celts, not the Anglo Saxons. And this glass gem may have come from a Welsh workshop. Uh, on, on the shoulder piece, which is shown separate, it says this remarkable conical object is made of gold and set with garnets. It contains small panels showing two animals, each trying to bite off the other's only leg. Its function is unknown. <laughs> so that doesn't help us really to understand what this one is. Yeah, because um, really like I said, it's mostly known to be Anglo-Saxon, but you've just thrown something there, um, Bill, that the Celts and that Wales, maybe this is just sort of my interpretation, maybe this is just evidence of that connection with uh, people before the Anglo-Saxons that they wanted to show off that they had a, possibly a connection with these people and so they, they incorporated yeah. that into their uh, metal to show off their connections or how good they are with the, the local people. I do think possibly this show in trade um, because they all would have been um, living together but in terms of the animal, um, just going back to the last uh, slide, if it lets me, um, this one here. Mm. I don't know if anyone can see it, but it looks like um, a, a, a bull or something like that. You can just see the horns. It's supposed um, to be an eagle. Brother. It's supposed to be an eagle. Oh, is it? It's in my book as well, yeah. It's, it's supposed to be uh, an oh. eagle. But that's what it says here anyway. Whether you, you think it's yeah. an eagle or not, I don't know. But uh, Yeah, because I was just looking at this being the, the, the face part, yeah, like um, the, 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 the ears and the face, yeah, and this part it. curling around being the horns. Um. I guess uh, some things like this we'll never know and so it just comes up to the interpretation of yeah. other people. But I like that you've brought that in there, Bill, because I think it just adds to the mystery of it all. And it, when you hear that this not being fully Anglo-Saxon, it has put a spanner in the works, really. Um, and it sometimes leaves me sitting on the fence. Um, I normally feel like that with some things that there's no conclusive evidence and it really frustrates me, especially when you're... Um, actually writing something and you, they, they say you've got to pick a side and I'll sit on the fence um it really stresses me out um and I yeah you can see that this would have been something that if this is a high status individual and they're trying to show that off especially with the gems and the gold maybe they're trying to show off their connection with the Celts um and oh, yeah. yeah yeah and I think also it just highlights that the Celts aren't as uh backwards is it is painting out if they're producing that glass gem as well. Was you going to say anything, Anne? Yeah, I just thought I thought they would have used, you know, a craft. They they would have used what you know whatever was fine, you know, that was mm. uh, was sort of they could get their hands on really. And if it was seen to be, you know, by Welsh craftsmen and it was good, then they they would want some of it. <laughs> mm. Mm. I think I, I, that the possibly we, we could be looking too much into it and it could be is what you said, Anne, that they were just looking for whatever they could find and just mm. incorporate it in. But this person is unintentionally really shown off the connections and the um, the way they would have mixed with uh, the people of Britain, mm. and it, it, in my eyes anyway. Mm. Um, I think things like this can tell us a lot about trades as well and connections with other civilization. Whether we're looking into it too much, that is what it is. Whether it was done intentionally, we won't know. Um, but I think this was, uh, the, again, people are saying that this is uh, the end as well. It's, this is what it says in the book with uh, that image there. It says, three pieces from the hood were identified as belonging together, although the purpose of the object is unknown. One is a stud with a multicolored glass and the, um, the largest piece of glass with the hoard. Um, so, so they're talking about this and they're saying it's unknown. 
Um, and to me, it just looks like a sword. And I don't think it was a sword that was used um, in battle. I do think this was something of um, personal use, um, possibly ceremonial as well. And maybe just strutting around, um, look at my amazing glittery swords. You, you haven't got one. Um, and I know in the medieval periods, when I've read about things in terms of... Uh, people in swords and the etiquette is that they believe that um, it, it was wrong for someone of lower status to have a sword. And so um, a lot of uh, lower class people were having um, wooden swords um, put on their person just to uh, try and be like the uh, upper class people who were walking around with swords around them, showing off their wealth and prestige with the swords. Um, it, it seems like that our modern day of um, something to show off on our person, maybe it being a mobile phone and uh, things like that. I know some people show off with their expensive mobile phones and then you've got my one that's cracked to hell, but um, it, it just seems like that sort of thing. I think it's something that's gone throughout time that people are using things on them to just highlight um, where they are in society or just look at me, I've got something better than you. Um, but yeah, it, it, to me, this just looked like a part of a sword. The fact that it's seen as unknown, um, I think it just it just maybe a lazy way, maybe just come up with a few theories rather than saying it's unknown. Um, after all, they, they're selling a book. So um, you, you want to add some more information to it. Mm. But we get to this amazing part of the hoard, which is the inscribed band. Um, and it, it was thought that it was intentionally bended before it was buried as well. So that's another thing that's been um, damaged. And you can definitely see from the writing that it's definitely um, Anglo-Saxon or possibly a little bit earlier. Um, but the reason why I know that is because as you go on throughout later time, things become a little bit more joined up. And this seems definitely with the P on the top, um, it definitely looks at Anglo-Saxon to so this P here looks Anglo-Saxon. Again, I'm going into this whole paleography sort of part of it all and uh, I could possibly bore you a little bit in terms of the uh, the writing of it all. I, I can get really, really um, geeky in terms of it, but we know just from the look of it that this is definitely by one scribe um, and it gets a little bit more damage as things go on. Um, but this was a band of gilt silver, which um, it had a biblical inscription in Latin on, on the, it. On the Book of Numbers, just a bit of interest to chess. Yeah, Book of Numbers 1035. Oh, you beat me to it. <laughs> it's all right, <laughs> Phil. Um, I forgot to put that in the uh, in the slide, but it does say, as I've written here, rise up, O Lord, and may the, thy enemies be dispersed and those who hate thee be driven from my face. Um, and one interpretation that I read for this, it was only one out of all the things that I've read of it, is that maybe this was something using to um, justify um, a battle of this uh, war lord as someone who uh, tried to fight him. Possibly some people have argued, and I, I have uh, thought this myself, is that possibly this book of numbers, um, 1035, was um, used to uh, argue against anyone that wasn't Catholic and sort of trying to reign over that and change it. Um, we know at the time that there was uh, quite a few groups of people from Britain who were pagan and that they're slowly going into Christianity, but maybe this was sort of this evidence to suggest that they were fighting against this and that they were almost like trying to uh, eradicate the, the old beliefs. Um, and I, again, I think it just highlights a little bit that the Anglo-Saxons weren't all cute and cuddly like a little care bear, that um, they, they were going out there and sort of getting rid of enemies, maybe enemies of their religion and um, just to, to fight against them, really. Um, but it's quite interesting it's been added to this horde. Um, to me, they all seem to uh, complement each other quite well. But um, the rivet holes on this suggest that it was originally attached to another object. Um, and quite a few people believe that this was possibly a Bible, um, which could have been carried on the person of an individual going into battle. Again, could be possibly ceremonial as well, um, which, which is quite interesting in itself. Um, and 
it, it, this I think was just the beautiful part of it all. I like seeing things with inscriptions, especially when I can geek out over the writing of it. Um, but I, it's it's very interesting how this biblical inscription is being brought into part of this because as much as this person saying, "Look at me, I'm wealthy, and I might have connections with these people, and um, I am a respected fighter," we see an evidence that um, they've got this religious side to them, and this seems to be something heavily important in their life. Um, and people are just using this to further highlight this warlord's identity as well. And who he was and what he thought of, like I said, um, in terms of identity, if we all sat here and said, write down a few things of identity, I would say, um, I'm a student, I work for Archaeology Cymru, I'm a, a female, I'm this, and um, a lot of people in the medieval period would be quite different. They might have similar things, but religion and the the what they carried on their person and how they were looking to everyone else is part of their identity and how they were able to show themselves off. So I do think this is part of it, that they're showing a bit of their identity through this inscription on this band, um, which again is just, this craftsmanship is amazing. Um, what would have been connected to a Bible, um, again, it's got this heavily, heavily detailed with um, gold wrapped um, around each other that's in a circle. Um, it's just a shame that we don't really know much about it. It seems to be something that we're knowing a lot about, but it's also something that's very mysterious. Um, and then you get to this folded cross, which is quite interesting as well. Um, it's a large gold cross, which is thought to be folded to save space within the hoard before it was buried. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion on this uh, cross. And the one that I liked is that um, this cross wasn't originally something that we would have seen um, from the Anglo-Saxons, that um, this is possibly something from the still remaining Roman Christianity or thought to be pagan Anglo-Saxon due to the design and the gems. But what's quite interesting is that we're seeing that it's got um, a, a, almost like a stand for it to be held into um, along with these gems. And to me, that they could possibly suggest that this was used for an altar, maybe it was... Um, used for ceremonial purposes. Maybe this person was traveling and they wanted to keep that with them. Um, I know some people, for example, um, I know in terms of the Catholic religion, they say that you can pray anywhere nowadays and you're talking to God. You don't always have to go to mass as long as you're talking to God. Um, but I know some people in terms of the Wicca religion, for example, um, they have their own little um, altar that is put into a box and they carry around with them um, just a mini mini version so maybe it's just a way of that individual carrying their religion around with them but that's what um, is come up with all this is that they're still um, having this argument of what it is and what it means but um, you can almost see I don't, see if I can get pen back up please come back up and um, make it a little bit thinner um, there's a, a face of an animal here. And um, the, the animal to me, you, it's not something that I've seen before. Some people have said that it's a duck and some people have said maybe it's uh, some sort of um, sea animal. Um, again, it's something that's not very clear. It's just something that looks like it's got a little bit of a beak that sticks out with an eye um, and it's got this long neck that is intertwined with the rest of the detail. Uh, um, rest of yeah the rest of the detail in of it and is again we're seeing from all these that they're not um something of a less advanced um period there's a lot of advanced things that are going on um and this is some of the things that we've seen in terms of uh pictish imagery this um intertwining of animals with other iconography maybe this was possibly something that was taken from influence of that um again showing their um, connection but um, some people believe that it was folded to be buried and some people believe that it was folded damaged um, before the burial suggesting many things in terms of one of the theories being um, what we've seen with Sutton Hoop with the helmet that this is a Viking tradition of breaking something before you bury it to uh, let that individual go. Hey, Jess can I make a comment again? Yeah go on Bill. Go back. And what I've got in my book is uh, that item, but from a different angle. 
And what you see there, the very end of it, is a fish's tail. Oh, and wow. And the bit, the bit which uh, comes, uh, leads into, is definitely a fish's body. You can see it clearly on mine. So yeah. the, the whole bottom is meant to be a fish, which does, does strongly suggest it's Christian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that, that, that whole uh, discussion, uh, well, fishes are used in Christian symbols today, um, and it, that whole 5,000 feet in the fish and um, a school of fish following his leader, just things like that, fish is, a, is an important um, imagery with that religion. Um, Bill, towards the end, would it be possible, um, when I finished with the presentation, if you could sort of hold the book up and talk a little bit and see if we can see what we're seeing from you as well? Yeah, well, that's certainly, yes. Yeah, no, thank you, Bill, because um, that, that, that's definitely something I want to see as well. This was uh, taken from the Stafford, Stafford Hood Shore uh, Staffordshire um, hordes um, online um, and this is the image they presented which they could have possibly done a better image really um, or even if they just done one of uh, it all moved you know, like a collage of them um, would have been better because it did leave me with what the hell is that animal but yeah it did definitely it makes sense that it being a fish to me it looked a bit like um almost like a little Loch Ness monster or a little long seahorse. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, again, um, it, it's the importance of uh, the sea in terms of religion as well. And, and it tells us a lot more. I think sea is uh, an important thing for people, I think, in terms of any period, because it's where we're seeing a lot of trade as well. And a lot of people are connected to the sea and it, it's affected their identity greatly in terms of religion and in terms of, um, trade. So I think C is something that is more than just a religious um, connotation. I think it means more in terms of the livelihood of the people. Um, and we get to uh, my favourite um, burial that I, I talk a lot about, which is Sutton Hills of the 7th century, um, so the 600s. Um, this is a, a burial that I'm just going to quickly touch upon because I have discussed this quite a bit. Um, but we're finding a lot of bits of treasure in terms of that as well. Um, this image of the helmet is a reconstructed one, um, by the way, as well. It's not what um, it's not what was found, um, it, which is uh, I think is quite good. But what's quite interesting is what you find about the reconstruction is that the face starts to become a little bit more smilier than usual. Um, each interpretation is different to its own, but it seems like um, there's been many reconstructions and each re reconstruction, it seems like he gets happier and happier. Maybe he's happy he's been reconstructed. Um, but this has been something that's very interesting because it's brought this um, debate on whether he's Anglo-Saxon or Viking. Um, and I seem to uh, feel a little bit stumped with this. I do think this is something that's um, Viking, but I do think they have um, influences from the Anglo-Saxons as well in itself. I was going to name this lecture Anglo-Saxon because the majority were, but I didn't feel like it was fair to brand certain who is Anglo-Saxon when we have no definitive answer. Um, I think it would be interesting to see if uh, the, the, the remains that were there but, um, of, of an individual, maybe that would have been used for DNA analysis and see where that individual had come from, because maybe this could settle this debate, but then you wouldn't have people like me that use this debate for their um, degree. Um, it, it was a very easy one, because it's that one where um, there's no conclusive evidence, you could argue either way. Um, but this led to a lot of theories and discussions, and it was found in 1938, as we know, um, by landowner Edith Pretty and Basil Brown. Um, and they discovered um, quite a group of barrows on her estate. And this one was the, the biggest one of uh, someone of high influence, of high importance. And we're seeing a lot of power, wealth and prestige here. Um, if anyone has seen the film on Netflix, um, they don't go into the treasure. Um, you do see one of the archaeologists pick up the coin and go, that's Anglo-Saxon and that's where it's left. Um, and again, they, they don't sort of go into the debate of it. And I think that's what frustrated a lot of history fanatics really was that there was more to do with um, the love interest and the sex and all this involved in it um, and the tragedy as well. Um, but I do think that they depicted the life of uh, Edith Pretty and Basil Brown quite well as well. 
but th this is something that's been quite of interest. I've looked at this. I've even looked at some evidence to show that this was almost like a, a burial ground um, with all the other mounds. And we're seeing something that's been used throughout time um, from the pro Iron Age period. Um, and there was um, a lot found here that, that can tell us a lot. And um, a lot of people believe this is Anglo-Saxon, but just something seems a little bit not right to me. Um, and this is uh, the part of the helmet as well. Um, so it's, it's very different to a reconstruction. Reconstruction looks very regal and in your face. Can, can you see as well, you see the, the, the face is the face. So when I show you um, the next image now, just look at the mouth with the mustache. It looks like he's smiling there. And then you get to this one and he's just very, mm. it's that difference of uh, interpretation in terms of the reconstruction. I think it, it's very frustrating. Um, one thing that I, I have uh, discussed about before is, um, get the pen out again, is this, um, it's like a, a, an animal, um, a, they've said that this is uh, like a bird of prey that is used for the nose, the eyebrows, um, and this is to uh, be for Odin um, in terms of war and um, just having luck almost and having that deity that is there to protect you throughout war. Um, and this is described by Bruce Mithford as well, that these pan pow powerful animals were used um, for the god of war, Odin. And uh, you see that in terms of if you see a crow nearby is uh, Odin and all that. Um, so I think this is showing uh, Scandinavian influence and this helmet is showing us that individual. Now, the more I look at it, the more I come out with different interpretations. And I was thinking, maybe, because quite people are, people are saying this moustache is something that is Anglo-Saxon facial hair. Um, and, but then the rest of it screams Viking. Maybe this is sort of evidence of an individual that could have possibly um, wanted to show this intermarriage, this connection with the Anglo-Saxons, that it wasn't all raping and pillaging, that the Vikings did um, have a connection with the Anglo-Saxons and um, weren't as negatively viewed as they were made out to be. Um, a lot of people say this is Raywald, and I do think the evidence of that is uh, very convincing. Um, especially when you get to the helmet. The helmet here for me seems to be the focal point of all this in terms of arguing that this is Viking. But like I said, there's three motifs and one of them has been broken. And um, it's, it's this Viking tradition of letting things go before they're buried, which is um, shown by uh, Bruce Mitford's argument. And he brings forward quite a, a, a very convincing one. He's, he's produced a lot of papers for it. Um, and... It, there's two fighting scenes that are shown and like I said this this pagan ritual of killing objects before um they're buried is seen in Beowulf um which is arguing that this is Viking because of that influence especially when you're putting towards um the the, the bird of prey there um but I think the facial feature could possibly just sort of suggest that this person just uh, like the influence and the style of the that one of the Anglo-Saxons and they into, brought that into themselves and they're putting their identity, how they looked into their helmet. I don't think this helmet would have been used for battle. I think this would have been used to uh, show off a little bit as well. Oh, my button on the laptop never works when I come onto a presentation. Aha. Um, and then you get to this part, which is the, the this is the thing that throws the spanner in the work for me. Is it, 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 I find it very frustrating. Um, it, it, does my head in when I have spanners in the work. Um, but this is um, something that is similar to the Staffordshire Horde, this um, colossal um, sort of creation, this uh, cell type thing with the garnets and the coloured um, uh, glass all being incorporated into something that's metal, um, fitted on with the beeswax. Um, it, it, to me, the, it's, it's a very confusing one, especially to a lot of academics, because he's suggesting that this has got an Anglo-Saxon influence. Maybe this individual is Raywald. Um, he's saying, um, I, I could possibly have taken the facial features off uh, an Anglo-Saxon because I liked it, um, but I'm keeping my identity in terms of the motifs. Like I said, there's a lot of 
uh, motifs that are going um, part of this. Um, you've got the Dancing Twins, which is describing a ritual before battle. And then you've got the Rider and the Fallen Warrior as they've fallen on the floor and they've won in his victory. Um, and we don't know what the third uh, motif would have been, maybe possibly a celebration afterwards. But um, what they have found with the garnet, and I don't know how they were able to find this, was that they're from Western Asia. So maybe this could have been the same sort of um, trade route that they had for the garnet in terms of the Staffordshire hoard, is that this um, idea of Western Asia. And uh, we know that there's evidence of the Vikings having connections with parts of Western Asia. And maybe the, it's not just highlighting the importance of long distance trade, but maybe highlighting um, this individual's high status in terms of their Viking uh, connections with other civilizations, and he's keeping true to that, while also showing that his influence of living with um, another group of people. Um, and I do think the Vikings are very um, tolerant and accepting, although we do see a lot of things of raids, and like I said last week, raid seems to be the, the normal of society the anglo-saxons done it and um, a lot of civilizations that have come here to conquer and to have conquest have done it it was just the thing to do so i think um the vikings had a bad rep because it was something that the anglo-saxons felt threatened by and um, we hear accounts of the uh, vikings looking rather dapper and well-groomed and the the women of the time think he, he looks quite gorgeous and leaving their husbands or not having anything to do with anyone from their community um, and maybe this is just them sort of holding on to power and just slating them more but I think this is just showing that the Anglo-Saxons um, could have possibly influenced the Vikings here in Britain as well and so we see things like this shoulder clasp but it's having trade in terms of um, Viking trade as well um, so it's quite interesting um, some people have definitely said because this is Anglo-Saxon but Whatever argument that you have, whether it be Viking, you've got the spanner in the works of this shoulder clasp. And I just tried arguing that this is just something they could have possibly liked. It, it's very eye catching, in your face, colourful. Um, and they possibly wanted to just take that on further because it, it is something that you would notice, um, especially with the colour as well. Um, and then I related to this burial quite a lot with the, the princely burial of Prittlewell. And uh, these are the two images. I haven't actually seen the excavation images. I've only seen the one that's online, which is the reconstruction. Um, but I like the fact that I found the um, image of the, the excavation because it does show you the layout and how things would have been when you look at the reconstruction. Um, you can see the barrel on the left-hand side and you can see that there was um, the horns in the corner. You can see how well it was set out. Um, and some people have related this burial, this Anglo-Saxon burial, with Sutton Hoo. Um, and one thing I've pointed out is that these horns used as a drinking vessel is very Viking. Um, I'll uh, get my little pen out just to show you exactly where it is, because you can't see it in the excavation, but you can see it here in the reconstruction. Those were used as drinking vessels, which is very Viking as well. Um, so maybe showing that not just the Vikings had taken from the Anglo-Saxons, but the Anglo-Saxons took from them as well. Or possibly this was someone living in the Anglo-Saxon period that was British and had um, felt the need to take from both of those cultures because they identified them. They felt like this was part of their identity. Um, nothing precious had been found in this um, hoard. Well, I say that they did find um, a a gold cross, um, which was two gold crosses, which were put over the eyes of the individual, um, which, again, it, it doesn't look very Anglo-Saxon, the crosses. Um, they're just very plain crosses. Um, but they think this is just a sign of maybe early Christianity, and this is showing the influences of their identity. This would have been um, a few years after the Sutton Hoo burial as well, but just like Sutton Hoo, we're not sure of the individual um, but there's a far more evidence suggesting that it was um, Anglo-Saxon um, rather than Viking anyway. And in terms of uh, me arguing that certain who was Vikings, the whole shit burial as well, um, because we see that up in Orkney. Um, but the Vikings, I think, they, is showing that they intermarried the influence of Britain through their own traditions and beliefs. And we're seeing it through all different hordes and burials. Ooh, please work off. Oh. 
still have the pen on. Move. Uh, there you go. And I've still got the pen on there. Um, there you go. Gone. Um, so we're just getting to um, the last hoard now, which is a very small hoard, um, but I just liked looking at it because it had a lot of um, just little interesting parts to it and there's not much being discussed. discussed. I just realised part of my sentence is missing towards the end as well. Um, I hate PowerPoint. <laughs> um, but this is something that we've got precious metals, um, is six gold objects, um, four gold finger rings, um, there was a, a lead a spindle wall there as well, um, which is not included into this image. Um, but they were discovered near Leeds in West Yorkshire in 2008 to 2009, again by a metal detectorist. Um, so today we're just picking up metal detectorists, especially the ones that are declaring these things because they're bringing us closer to our knowledge of history. Um, it must have been frustrating to make this be known as well because it would have been something that I would have uh, loved to take for myself and wear the bling myself as well. Um, but this is um, this has been thought to be national and international sig significance. Um, and this is showing to me that early medieval period, again, it's, it's, it's not a period that is lacking skill or anything of an advancement because it is. But it was found... Um, by a metal detectorist, Frank and uh, Rusty. Um, and he found the four rings and the gold brooch as well. And he informed the portable antiquities scheme. Um, what a legend. And um, they had then surveyed the field themselves. And six months later in 2009, um, further down the slope from where it was, another gold ring um, and a, a lead spindle wall was found nearby as well. So they're finding quite a bit here. Um, but it's quite interesting the discussion of what happened and what it is as well, um, because there's a lot of people um, discussion, uh, discussing who and what and why and all that jazz. Um, some people believe that this is something of thieves again, um, but we'll get into that. So um, we'll discuss the first ring, which is my favourite, and you can see the little um, little balls of decoration there. Um, you can see the, the, the spirals. Um, this would have been something, I think, I'm not very good with little tiny things that require um, light hands. And I'm very heavy handed. So um, again, someone with great craftsmanship, great patience, nothing like me. Um, it, it, this is beautiful even down to the gem you're having this zigzag design all around it um and it, the the band is quite interesting because it's a twisted gold band um which is thought to be um quite interesting but this is dated from the 10th century and i think is the most impressive of the whole hordes that they had found um and it's a, it's a naturally a flawed oval garnet um with a, a dog tough setting which is a uh, turned uh uh, in turn framed by gold um twisted gold wire and these gold palette of little balls um they add more detailing and decoration and bring more space into all of this and the hoop is rare and uh, in his style um because this whole twisted rod of it is, is very different for this was which is uh, connected to the back of the uh, the basil of the ring but it's, the decoration of this is very crisp um, and it does not appear to be worn to a great extent. It seems to be something that would have been worn um, on a few occasions for Im important occasions. Um, and you definitely see something that you could uh, buy today, really. Um, I know there's a lot of places that do um, vintage stuff in terms of really old vintage stuff. Um, I don't know whether anyone remembers, um, there was a shop in town, I absolutely loved it, um, and it was my mum's favourite as well, they'd done um, jewellery based on Tudor period, medieval periods, um, but it was all contemporary, it was called Pastimes, um, and it was in town, um, but it was very beautiful, and it just reminds me of one of the things you could have possibly bought that is gone now, um, sadly, uh, but it does even look like something could part, because I've got these lovely um, Tudor-style earrings and it, with garnets and 
pills on it and it does look like it would be part of that as well even though it's a different time period but what I'm saying is that this looks like it was just made yesterday and um, despite the little bits of um, mud that is still inside it but it's got this shiny gold like the Staffordshire hood that they're trying to show off and allow it to reflect in the sunlight and show off a little bit more um, but they believe that this is uh, 10th century, possibly early 11th century, but a lot of people have gone with 10th century. But this is someone of high status who had owned this ring and possibly owned, uh, worn it at important uh, times um, rather than it being worn all the time. It wouldn't have been um, a very practical ring to wear, um, definitely. Um, and then we get to this one. Um, looks like uh, like the gold rings that people wear nowadays just a little bit more decorated um and definitely beautiful this is the thickest one out of all of them and is the best condition um some people argue out of all of them as well um i think they're all in similar um conditions really um but this one was the one that was found in uh, 2009 and it does look like it was created yesterday with all that detailing going they're going above and beyond they just don't go for a little bit of detail and they're going for the whole thing and it's a box like construction which is covered in a lot of complex decoration that um maybe this is sort of representing a vine they believe that the decoration is possibly representing a vine of something um and you know that vines have got a lot of um, discussion in terms of this period um, in terms of religion as well. Um, some people believe that theory of God is like a farmer. Um, he plants the seeds um, and if they want to grow, they'll grow and they grow into these beautiful vines after the person has upkept their relationship with God. So that's what some people have argued. Um, and it's a popular motif, like I said, in religious uh, imagery. And it, it appears to be um, a sealed chamber um, as well. Um, and the X-ray examination shows that this object may be organic. And one is said is used to hold a relic inside of it as well. So um, they haven't actually opened it, which it would be quite interesting. But I think they're more focused on preserving it rather than damaging it. And um, we have said that archaeology can be damaging as well. Um, and this is this is thought to be the the uh, ninth to the tenth century as well. But most people again are sticking with this tenth century, um, th this tenth century belief. But I like this whole idea of the vines and this religious imagery incorporated into it. Um, and we see this other ring as well. Um, this ring um, is, is the same sort of thing. It's got these uh, spirals on it. It's a very different one. Um, there's no vines coming off at this point. Um, and this is the most worn out of all of them. So maybe this would have been possibly someone's everyday ring. Um, and it's the thinnest one as well. Um, I know that when you wear rings, for example, I'm looking at my rings, if you wear them, especially if you're wearing more of one, yeah. um, the back part of it becomes a lot more thinner. Um, and it's just fine that it's been worn quite a lot and this possibly would have been something that was um, important to the individual that had owned it. Um, but this is argued not to be someone of high status. Um, I don't agree with that. I think maybe this is something that is someone of high status, but someone who um, this wasn't something for important ceremonial um uh, practices this was just something that they possibly would have worn on a daily basis I've got um, rings that I wear on a daily basis and I've got rings that I wear for special occasions and it could be that sort of situation um, but no date has been given to this ring but they believe that this is one of the earliest ones out of the ring at uh, rings um, even saying that it's the late 8th century so um, there's quite a range of dates here going on um, and then we get to this finger ring um, which again, it's got, it's got this animal, it looks like a bird, this um, incorporated with this, uh, this twisted in, uh, imagery. And um, it has four panels onto it. And um, some of them are plant motifs as well. And this whole idea of growing this plant, um, it, it, it's this idea of this person sort of showing their growth, maybe spiritually or maybe through life. We've lost you. Yeah, we froze. Mm. 
We've lost you. Oh, I am. Oh. How do you, how do you, how do you chat? Hmm? Oh. You just type, click on chat and type. Well, well, hang on, everybody. Um, Jessica's asked me to come on. She'll be back in a couple of minutes, okay? Okay. Yeah, she, she's ne she's nearly at the end, so just ha hang on a couple of minutes. Okay, stay there, guys. Nice rings. <laughs> mm. I'm one of them myself. Mm. Probably get reproductions. In that past times that Jess mentioned, that shop, yes. was a lovely shop, and they did reproductions yes. of things. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I was, I, I may as well come on a minute. Um, um, Pete, I'm going to need a chat with you at the end with uh, Jessica, okay? Are you there, yeah. Pete? Right, yeah, yeah. Um, Right, I, I was just about to say that we've um, we've received an, um, a considerable grant, um, and it means that I'm I can take some time off. Um, so I'll be taking a week off in the next um, couple of weeks or so. Um, mm -hmm. And um, obviously, um, Jessica doesn't know this yet, but she'll be given a full time job very shortly, um, and uh, uh, handsomely paid. So. Um, uh, she's she's on her way in a minute, and, um, and she's that, lost in the uh, she's 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 lost in the ether. So she'll be back in a minute. Oh uh, yeah, well I was just about to mention that um, um, about the the thing with the, the having the day schools and the studio being used. We'll be back using the studio very soon. Jessica's um, back now. So if anyone wants to ask me anything at the end, stay behind at the end, Peter, because um. I, I, I need a favour. Use Jessica. Hand it over to her. <laughs> You've been warned, Pete. Uh, actually, I... actually, for once, for once, I'm not asking Pete for money. But the what? thing is, right? <laughs> the thing, the thing is, right? Um, um, you, you can't believe everything a Celt tells you. What now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry about that, everyone. Um, I was in the middle of talking. I had Bill in the right um hands. Uh, bit for me and it just went all blue and said the problem with your device it turned me off and kept, brought me back on again so at least he'd done that rather than just breaking completely um first thing I did was talk was talk to Carl so we'll quickly get into this I'm nearly finished um I realized I've gone over time as well so I apologize for that um but this ring again is, is a lot more thicker and it's thought to be um the ninth century which is a, a little bit earlier than some of the other ones that we're discussing as well um, and then they found this golden gust as well, which is quite interesting. They believe that this was uh, used possibly for currency at the time. It's a large lump of gold. Not much has been discussed on it, rather than the fact that it was possibly owned by a high status person, um, which then leads us really to uh, what happened with this hoard. Why was it put um, where it was? But we got to another brooch that was using this same sort of technique as the Staffordshire one, as the Sutton Who one. Um, this uh, idea of getting garnet and sticking them on, they believe that this is evidence of that. We've, we've only got a fragment of the brooch um, and archaeologists have tried reconstructing it. Um, however, um, a lot of reconstructions have come out of this. But um, this would have been worn with uh, maybe glass or garnets in it. Um, they haven't found the stones or the glass that have been put inside it. But if we're going along with the Staffordshire hoard and the Sutton Who hoard, um, possibly garnet, the red garnet, uh, with a little bit of uh, bluish glass. It goes with that style, with this shiny gold as well. Um, again, showing that this would have been a high status individual. Um, a lot of people are saying that this is the 7th to the 8th century as well. And this is someone of important uh, importance as, um, as well. So we've seen a lot of this technique being used in the Anglo-Saxon period um, and definitely been taken on by possibly Vikings in terms of the Sutton Who burial. Um, but definitely they, they're a culture of people that are interested in the, um, the detailing and just showing off through detailing. I, I like a bit of detailing on my rings. Um, I just think it just makes it even more interesting when you look up close. But nothing is conclusive of what happened to them. Um, most um, believe that this is um, uh, 
buried as it was stolen. This is someone who'd stolen it and they buried it to try and hide it. Mm. Um, and the horse has been found from different artifacts from a range of years. So people believe that, um, some people have believed that there's evidence that these hordes were um, being unburied, you, to sort of have, having on the person that's stolen them and they're reburying them again um, and they're picking them back up again and they're reburying them um, and things are coming from different periods. Um, and some people are just blaming thieves for this hoard being buried. And why is it in a, such a random space rather than being in a, a, a burial? Because if this is a high status individual, you could imagine them being buried of all this on their fingers. Um, and it's not, um, especially in terms of the golden gut being something this um, of currency. Um, this possibly would have been someone's little bank robbery at the time. And they were just trying to hide the evidence until it all died down again. Um, but unfortunately, they could have possibly lost it or um, they, 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 they could just pass before they could even tell anyone about it. And we had found it quite recently. Um, but in, con ooh, in conclusion, I think I hope I've shown you that the early medieval period isn't um, is lacking, as some people believe that they're very advanced in terms of their craftsmanship. Um, these hordes are showing that this is a period that has relations with other cultures in terms of trade, in terms of influence, in terms of religion, and how iconography is being put into rings to show off um, a, a lot more um, in terms of the vines, in terms of the uh, flowers, this growing of the soul, um, showing that this person could possibly have importance in terms of their religion. And then you have um, Sutton Hu with the warrior motif, showing that this is someone who would have been a good fighter, um, alluding to this being Viking as well in terms of the traditions of breaking something. But I think the Staffordshire, Staffordshire hoard is the most impressive for the quantity and the quality of the artefacts. Um, the ones that I've shown you have only given you a brief outlook onto it, but it shows how advanced the Anglo-Saxons were in creating these beautiful pieces of art through jewellery and possibly the Vikings had decided to take this on and we've seen it in Sutton Who. Or maybe the Vikings had sort of traded with the Anglo-Saxons. Um, last Thursday I did talk about how it has been cases of Anglo-Saxons and Vikings changing their the way they speak so they can understand each other a little bit clearly in terms of trade. And it shows to me that the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings weren't as um, uh, rivalry as we think. And they were much more close in terms of intermarrying, in terms of um, influence, religion, and in terms of trade. But this is a period of illumination, a period of uh, illumination from jewelry in terms of uh, different techniques of uh, grandness. And to call it the Dark Ages, that's not truth, because um, we're seeing um, this being a period where they reflect light in terms of their jewellery to show off a much brighter um, reputation of themselves. And I think that's something that needs to be brought forward in popular culture, rather than seeing it being a period where um, there was just nothing going on, because there was a lot going on. Um, and we're seeing highly advanced techniques um, to create the detailing of this treasure and to further um, show us um, how advanced they are and, and letting the individual show how rich they are by commissioning such things. Um, so I'll stop share now um, and I'll ask, ask questions. I wonder if you could show your images, if that's all right, Bill. Yeah, um, okay then. Um, the the stuff that you hold, this is the folded cross. Let's have a look now if you can get up. This is the folded cross. Um, can you see the tail? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And you see the body going out. Yeah. And there should be a little eye there at the head and a little mouth. So the base of the folded cross is definitely a fish. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. Bent in that way. You know? mm. um, yeah. Well, this, this is a book called uh, Lost Gold of the <clears throat> Dark Ages. So it's a very it's a very expensive book, actually. But it covers all, all the... Um, the, the artifacts and things that you talked about tonight, uh, Jess. The, 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 the Staffordshire Hoard is an absolute mystery, isn't it? Mm. But you're right, you did mention that it appears that uh, it was a deliberate act to actually deform or break up the different uh, precious possessions of whoever owned it, presumably a king or some of your status, and then put it in the ground, but not with him in the grave. Separate yeah. from the grave, that's, that's really odd. Mm. Now, the other mystery is, why on earth wasn't stolen? People around there must have known something was going on. Yeah. That's a mystery, isn't it? 
It's like two, yeah. like two Carmen's and really all that gold, and it's just laid hidden. You know, they couldn't get to it. Yeah, so it's a big, big mystery, isn't it? Uh, this stuff in particular, you know, for what yeah. the craftsmanship. I wonder where the gold mines are. Where do they get the gold from? Because we, we um, know we in West Wales, but the gold mines are uh, in other parts of the UK. I'm not sure about my geology and that. Yeah. Maybe no, I, I know that there's what one in uh, Wales, uh, West Wales, like you said, mm. but I'm I'm not too sure. Um, because it seems like they are getting their gold from somewhere, whether whether that be trade as well. I think it's um, trade abroad, sure. actually. Yeah, the only one um, I say is, is in West Wales, really. Mm. But I know of anyway. Yeah. And and you you know they didn't. I mean that's one thing that I wondered. If you know, I thought that the Saxons didn't go into Wales, but Presumably, they might have gone in to trade, or it's you know, um, did they go yeah. into trade? I Possibly, yeah. No, I mean, um, so you know, they might have bought that gold from Wales, and um, there's yeah. one gold yeah. mine in Wales, I think. Yeah. And I've just found here that there's a um, gold that's been found up in um, mid Scotland. Um, Northern Ireland, um, some in Cornwall as well, um, and yeah. uh, near York as well. So maybe this is possibly where they're finding yeah. their gold as well. Yeah. yeah. Mm. It's it just, it, I mean, it's this burial, you know, the burying of stuff. I mean, yes, it, 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 it could be treasure. It could be stolen goods. It could be wanting to hide um, you know, wanted to hide stuff, or this being broken and then buried. You know, ceremonial. It's it's uh, it's still a mystery. <laughs> mm, I was possibly thinking, um, would they bury like we've got that possibility of people stealing things or wanting to hide it. Um, but maybe this is a, an individual that died and their family had never seen them again and they wanted to bury their stuff and that's how mm. they've done it. Um, mm. And that's why we're seeing these hordes in random places. Mm. Um, it's almost like their burial, their closure and saying goodbye to someone um, rather than, you know, just leaving it to the fact of, um, you, you know, my, my husband's gone to a, a battle and he died um, and that's all I've got. Maybe they wanted to do something for themselves. And so um, burying his um, prized possessions was possibly the greatest thing to do. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, Peter, anything that you'd like to ask or add? No, no it's fine. Thanks. No, good. No, thank you, Peter. Um, Anne, anything, add it, anything extra you want to add or have you just gone through what you said? I think it's just another mystery. And, and uh, But I love those gold rings. I, oh, they're gorgeous. And, um, you know, I, and, I, and the other idea is that, of course, you know, the Christian church, they would have had churches at that time. So, you know, they would have been buried in, in a grave, you know, um, mm. and... And they wouldn't have had their goods taken with them, you know, because yeah. they didn't believe in doing that in the Christian church. It was you buried your body and that was it, you know. All your goods, you would be good, so separate. So that's, uh, that's something. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you, Anne. Um, thank, thank you. you very much, anyway. <laughs> it's all right. Um, Richard? Yeah. Well, the big thing I always find fascinating is how they the jewelry is so you know a jeweler today would have problems oh yeah doing some of that with hey. decent light and a decent magnifying lenses so yeah. how they how they you know and it's like a lot of the stuff especially the cloisonne you know where they put the oh enamel amethysts and everything because it usually now it's they still do it now, but they usually put enamel in, mm. you know, in the gaps rather than, you know, cut stone to fit and everything. Yeah. So it just yeah. shows how advanced they're, you know, yeah. they work. 
And I, I think one thing, going back to how it's viewed as the Dark Ages, um, almost like a, a period where they're lacking um, any technology, any uh, skill. Um, I, I was sort of looking at my jewellery when I was looking at all this, and I was thinking, it's a lot more advanced than the jewellery that I'm wearing now. Even, even though there's a lot of detail into my jewellery, it seems very simple and plain compared to what we're looking at. So mm. I think we're viewing them very negatively and bigging ourselves up a little bit more. Um, uh, they're definitely, like you said, Richard, they would be jewellers um, that would have difficulties with a lot of things that they've done here. Um, and it just highlights that they were possibly on a much more advanced uh, plane than we were in terms of jewellery. Um, but thank you for that. I like that. Um, Bill, anything else added that you want to add? Um, I know you've had a little bit of a say, but any more questions? No, no, thank you, Jess. No, the, thank the, you, Bill. The mystery remains. Yeah, the, well, um, like my uh, my my mum used to have a, a priest coming over um, when I was younger, when I was in the Catholic school, and every time she asked him a question, it would be, it's a mystery. So I think I'll end it with, it's a mystery. <laughs> That's a song, isn't it? It's a mystery. <laughs> okay, thanks, Jess. It's all right, guys. Um, yeah. Take care. Well, um, bye, then. Um, bye, everyone. Yeah, bye, bye, Bill. Bye, Richard. Uh, or oh. Carl or or Jess. Um, yes, yeah, stay behind and um, and me and Carl uh, have a little natter with you at the end. Carl, uh, what, 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 what 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 do you want to say? I'm gone. Oh, um, just to say, if Pat isn't coming tomorrow because she's on holiday, um, could I ask if Dorothy could come just to have a look? Just have, you know, like um see how she feels about it or would you rather not come back um i'll, I'll leave that down to uh carl um yeah uh, the, the the thing the thing is the thing is um it it, it was it was always going to be the bottom line that um she either comes back and stays or she doesn't yeah so, so that's yeah. basically the situation mm. there's, there's no middle line no. Um, you know, we, we've uh, we, we've got some serious stuff going on this year and um, people are either with us or they're not. So she, she can come along and... Um, um, but, but if she has to go, if she has to go, uh, if we have to go back online and she can't go back online... Uh, we... Archaeology Cymru's policy is, is that we're, we're going to completely ignore um, all these regulations and stuff. They're unenforceable forcible in court absolute nonsense we've got a business to run and lots of other business people are in the same boat where uh, the main thing is uh, not followed the rules once yeah we're, we're, it's, it put it this way lots of businesses now are just not going to follow the rules because all this stuff has been absolute non nonsense it's completely destroyed the country um and we're just going to continue going so um it's likely that we won't be going back online we'll just be doing physical classes the thing is you've all been vaccinated so why should there be a problem well, I haven't been vaccinated, but you guys have, so that's fine. Um, so yes, Doroth, bring Dorothy along, and that that's that'll be fine. All right. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Um, oh, and, and there is one other thing. There is one other thing. If you allow me to look at my email now, um, if if you allow me to look at my Facebook, I might actually have a decision from Hope Baptist Chapel whether to say whether we can start there tomorrow. Um, I'm, I'm just I'm just checking now. I've just got to check my email. Uh, Mary was going to contact me this evening. Uh, they've had a meeting and whether it's possible or not. So um, obviously it, it's probably going to be ex because everybody's already gone. But um, uh, I'm just going to double see if I I've, I've not had the reply yet, but I might have one uh, by the end of play tonight. So um it'll mean that you can either tell everybody next week whether you're going to be at the hall or, or you're never going to be up there again. Yeah, right. but, but, well, that would be good, but we will have to pay. I wonder how much they're going to charge us. Uh, well, if, if it put it this way, um, you're paying 10 quid for the thing at this minute, teas and coffee. So it's a matter of paying 10, 12 pounds and then teas and coffee yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So that's, that, that's the way it'll yeah. be done. All right. Okay. The main main thing is we've got to get this thing moving. This this COVID nonsense that needs to stop. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what to say. I mean, uh, uh, why did I shield? I, I know, I know, I was shielding, 
And now I had my two vaccines and I've had my, you know. Yeah, yeah, te te technically, your life is normal again. Yeah. yeah no, no, obviously, you still have the precautions of washing your hands and yeah. all, all that. Yeah. Um, we should have done that in the first place anyway. Yeah, no, I, I, I hate the fact that he always brought that up. <laughs> Yeah. Do you know, do you know what? I enforced. I'm sure people have, have actually, by washing their hands, have actually saved quite a lot of illnesses. Well, we should be it. doing that anyway. Do you know what I mean? But, you know, I n didn't wash my hands for 20 seconds. N never. I mean, you know, it was probably 10. You know. It's better than nothing, though, Anne. Better than nothing, exactly. Than nothing. You could have someone looking back in the future going, these people were dirty, they had to be told how to wash their hands. That's exactly. what I felt like. Well, I, I'll be thrilled if we can go back to uh, Hope. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so and, will Robert. And uh, Peter might be interested to hear that we might be starting a Cardiff class soon, but we don't know anything more about that yet, do we, Jessica? Um, no, but I, I've got someone who might be interested in that, so I, I'm recruiting a bit of a team there. So, so it'll be it, it might if, if if Peter wants to go to Cardiff again, it'll be Peter, Roger, Sandra, uh, Ken. Um, it might be Chris. Um, it'll be basically most of the old gang. But well, you know, Sandra's not going to be well enough to travel. But it's it, in principle, we've we've got we need to open up and get things moving yeah. again. Mm. He's quite happy where he is, but you know, it gives an if, if Pete wants to go we'll to Cardiff, we'll catch up at home. Day, yeah, if Pete wants to go to Cardiff one day, then then that'll be an alternative. He wants yeah. to pretend if he wants. Oh, he don't want to go to pretend and have to listen to you. <laughs> uh, anyway. <laughs> All right, I'll go now then. Anyway, um, you, Ryan. I'll best, you tomorrow. best of luck if you get a phone call off me, then you know what's going on. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. So, cool. Um, a date would be great. Um, yeah, well, we've had, many, <laughs> we've had many dates like that. Right.